All right. Are we good? Welcome, everyone. I know uh, we got some guys coming in yet from the fellowship. Hope you guys had some good uh, food to eat tonight. Um, it's always good, isn't it, to uh, get together with other men and, and hang out and, and eat some food and, and uh, talk about our lesson tonight. So, tonight's lesson is um, Jesus heals a man born blind. So we're going to pray and then uh, we'll get started here. Lord God, uh, what a great privilege we have tonight to, to study your word, to study how gracious you are, how, how wonderful and, and compassionate you were to this man uh, that was born blind, and how you can show us what true, uh, true sight really is. And I just help, I pray that you would help us to understand um, what you would have us to learn tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So, uh, the big idea this uh, week is spiritual sight versus spiritual blindness. And uh, the doctrine is God the Son, and the attribute is gracious. We're going to see that through and through tonight. And the aim here is that only Jesus can make blind eyes see. And we're not just talking about physical uh, sight here. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm so glad John put this... This, uh, this actual account in Scripture. I mean, I think the Holy Spirit, uh, who inspired John to write this, really wanted us to know uh, what true uh, sight and true blindness is. And we're going to actually see this man's faith grow as, as, the, as the night goes on. But I, I want to do a first a quick review, because um, it's, to me it sets it up a little bit of why we see so much spiritual blindness um, and so two weeks ago, in chapter 7, if you remember right, the Jewish leaders tried to seize Jesus, and then they tried to arrest him. And, and last week, uh, they tried to trap Jesus uh, with a no-win scenario, and they uh, obviously failed at that. Um, and then, last week also, Jesus, um, he amped up his uh, statements about who he is and about what the Pharisees uh, about their blindness. And so he said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. And that isn't uh, contentious. That's just a, a fact. Uh, the Pharisees, they refused to acknowledge Jesus as the light of the world. And so he told the Pharisees last week, where I go, you cannot come. And it says, if you don't believe in the one I, that, that I claim to be, which is the Son of God, then you're going to die in your sins which means you can't come to where I am, which means you can't come to heaven. Um, and then he cranked it up a notch and he said, if God were your father, you would love me because I came from God, which is true. So if God wasn't their father, then who is their father? Jesus said, your father's the devil. Um, and then he cranked it up another notch and said, before Abraham was born, I am, which made himself equal with God. So. He wasn't trying to rile up the Pharisees. He was just telling them the truth. And, and I think in a way that would maybe help them open their blind eyes. But as you know, when he, after he said that, they picked up stones and tried to stone him. And so um, here's the deal. Every encounter the Pharisees had with Jesus um, was a chance to see who Jesus was. But their, their pride and their anger kept keeping their blindness up. And we're going to see that to, in tonight's uh, chapter 2, in, or in this chapter 9. Um, so I d divided this up between a blind man sees and seeing men becomes blind. Uh, seeing men become blind. So please turn your Bibles to chapter 9 uh, and verse 1. And it says, so as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So just like in Job's day, uh, when Job's three friends came and said, oh, all this calamity that came upon you, it must have been that you have some really bad secret sin. And Job's saying, no, I, I, I don't. Um, and so the whole book of Job pretty much is them saying, you're wrong, Job. You, you have some secret sin. Why don't you fess up? Um, 
But he, so, so the common thought of that day was that if you had a disability, um, it was a direct result of some, someone sinning. Now, we know that all pain, sickness, death is a result of sin, because in Adam and Eve sinned, death came into the world. Romans 5 says it this way, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all men have sinned. Death is the enemy. It, death is ugly. It's, it, it encompasses so many things. And it's the last enemy that's going to be destroyed in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, now, in some cases, sickness and death is a direct result of our sin choices. Think of um, using drugs and alcohol, all right? Um, but the thought that all major disabilities are a direct result of a specific sin is wrong, and Jesus puts that to rest. He says in verse 3, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. It doesn't mean that the parents and this man were sinless. It just means that there wasn't a specific sin that they did that was a direct result in causing this man to be born blind. So I want to just put, let's put ourselves in the parent's shoes here for a little bit. Um, because let's, let's just, I know that, that there are couples in this class that have prayed and prayed and have not been able to conceive. And my heart goes out to you because I know that uh, th those prayers uh, are constant. And, and God, but we know that God uses trials for his glory. And none of us, none of us escape having trials. Now imagine the joy of this New Testament couple when they found out that they were pregnant. Back then they didn't have ultrasounds, so they didn't know, you know, if it was a boy or a girl. But imagine the additional joy when it was a boy. Because back then, if you had a boy, your family name would be carried on and, and you would be taken care of in your old age. Um, and then, the discovery. Something wasn't right with his eyes. Then the realization. Our baby is born blind. The joy turn to sorrow. Probably lots of why questions for God. Maybe even some anger at God. God, how could and why could you uh, allow this tragedy to come my way? The question is, have you ever been there? Have you ever been there where, where you have some pretty serious why questions for God? I know I have. Um, questioning God due to some pain or some trial that, that he allowed in your life, um, where joy may turn to sorrow. I know it, at the time, for me, it was a deep, sorrowful, painful place to be. Um, but here's where I had to struggle a little bit. Because Jeremiah 29, 11, we've all heard this verse. I hear it a lot at graduations and, and all kinds of things. But it says, I know I, I, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, a baby born blind doesn't look like prospering to me. From the world's, eye, from the world's eyes, it looks like harm, right? Um, how could a loving God allow something like this to happen? And maybe you know someone who has a special needs child, or maybe you have one, but know this, that... Um, being born blind or with special needs is not an accident. Being born um, doesn't just happen. Exodus 4.12, when, when, when God's talking to Moses, he says this, he says, Who gives man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? So everything that we have and everything that happens to us comes from the Lord. If your eyes work, great, it's a gift from God. If they don't work, great, it's a gift from God. If your legs work, same thing. Um, if you're able to produce wealth, great, it's a gift from God. And if we don't have some of these serious uh, disabilities, it's not because we're more deserving. Um, 
But whatever trials come our way, it's not about us. That's the whole point. It's not about us and our wants, um, even maybe our needs. It's about giving glory to God and that he would be glorified. So I think both of these scriptures can be true. Because in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, it says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. And sanctification sometimes is is through trials so that our faith grows and so that our our dependence on God grows because God is sovereign we learned that a few weeks ago and we need to trust him with whatever comes our way and you know what it's because he loves us he loves us more than we can even imagine so back to the lesson this boy uh, now grows up and he has to beg for a living now, his parents are still alive, but maybe they were too poor to provide for him, but the scripture doesn't say. All we know is that uh, as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth, and the disciples had their questions. And I just love how Jesus does this. Neither his man or his parents sinned. So he, he puts just on, on its head the thought that uh, sin had caused this. And if we think of it from an eternal perspective here, this disability it seems to have softened this guy's heart to the point of being willing to believe in the Lord Jesus. We're going to see that later in the chapter. And who knows, maybe without being blind from birth, he, he could have been one of the proud Pharisees that rejected Jesus. So if you think of it that way, um, what a great God we have. He orchestrated this so that this man would truly see. Uh, you know, maybe uh, yeah, this man heard all the whisperings of the religious leaders. Um, I've been told that uh, blind uh, folks have a keener sense of hearing. And so he probably heard everything. He probably heard the disciples ask their questions. Who sinned? This man. Um, the attribute this week is gracious. And Jesus' encounter with this man is going to change him uh, forever. When we encounter Jesus, he changes us. The question is, do we resist that change or are we accepting and obedient of that change? So in verse 4, it says, Jesus said, as long as it's day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work, and while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus is, is bringing that same message of he's the light of the world each weak here and he's about to bring real light to this poor beggar so in verse 6 he spits on the ground makes some mud with his saliva and puts it on the man's eyes go he told him wash in the pool of Siloam this word means sent so the man went and washed and came home seeing now do you notice what Jesus said he said go wash in the pool of Siloam he didn't tell the man he would he would be healed he just said go wash and the man there was something about Jesus that he had enough faith to go okay I'm gonna go do this I mean he could have said you're crazy why would I want to have to find my way all the way to that pool I'm blind you know right but he had enough faith to obey what Jesus told him to do um, so <laughs> He went and washed and came home seeing. Can you imagine the joy? Can you imagine the excitement? Trying to take in, I mean, blind from birth. I, I can't get it in my head. Blind from birth and then all of a sudden seeing everything. Um, seeing his parents for the first time. Seeing his home, seeing his friends if he had any. Seeing his neighbors, we know he had neighbors. Hey, it's me. Uh, verse 8, uh, they, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging said, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, it only looks like him. But he insisted, hey, I'm, I'm the guy. Then how were your eyes opened? The man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to wash in the pool of Siloam. So I went and washed and I could see. The man they called Jesus 
If you remember a few weeks ago when Jesus was going to go up to the Feast of the Tabernacles and all the whispering that was going on about, where is this Jesus? Who is he? You know, is, he the, is he the Christ? Is he not? Um, maybe, he, maybe he heard all those whispers. Um, but at this point, the man hadn't seen Jesus. He had an encounter with him. He heard him, but he didn't know what he looked like. Um, but I think the crowd knew, and certainly Pharisees knew what the implications were. Isaiah 35 says that when the Messiah comes then the eyes of the blind will be opened. Giving sight to a, to a blind man is a divine activity. Isaiah 42 says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you, and I will make you to be a covenant for the people and the light to the Gentiles, to open the eyes that are blind, to free the captives from prison, and to release from the dungeons those who sit in darkness. The healing proved that Jesus was the Messiah. So the principle of this first section is only Jesus brings real sight to those who humble themselves before him. Jesus brings real sight to those who humble themselves before him. Um, so God caused this man to be born blind, knowing all of the difficulties that come with that disability, and I don't know about you, but I think blindness does humble a man. It should. The question is, do, when, when hardships come our way, do we let it humble us? It should. Only Jesus can bring both physical and spiritual sight to anyone. And, but we must humble ourselves before him. Here's the thing. We were all spiritually blind at some point in our lives. We were all spiritually blind. Who saved you? Jesus or your own actions? Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says that salvation is a gift from God so that no one can boast. And to me, the opposite of boasting is humbleness. Do you humble yourselves before Jesus? Do you acknowledge him as the only savior of the world? Do you make him Lord of your life? Giving up your imagined control of your life to him? Have you made him Lord of your family, of your finances, of your time? Jesus brings real and eternal light to those who humble themselves before him. Isn't that wonderful? So now we go to the second division, seeing men become blind. And I think the, the real uh, interesting stuff starts to happen here because the Pharisees investigate, all right? Um, and uh, many of the Pharisees have already made up their mind, we know, about who Jesus is, and it's not good. Um, they seem to be so hung up on the Sabbath laws because um, when you spit and make mud, that's work. That's considered work on the Sabbath. And so not only did he heal him, but, but he uh, made some mud. And we know they're missing the forest for the trees, but we also know that it's probably because of their pride getting in the way of understanding who Jesus really is. And I don't know about you, but we all have to do a pride check uh, now and again, right? Because um, we have to understand that it's not about us. Like I said before, it's about, it's about Jesus. And I, what I see here is that, is that the, the, the boldness of the blind man increases with every step of the way. We don't know if it was the same day that he was healed, that he was called into the Pharisees, or days later, but obviously his parents knew about the healing, the neighbors knew about the healing, and, and you can bet, uh, even though Jerusalem had a lot of people in there, the gossip tree probably was rocking, so everybody was, had to be talking about the man who was born blind and was healed. So the Pharisees need to understand what's going on here. So in verse 16, uh, some, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. They're, talk, they're talking about Jesus. Um, but others ask, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? And they were divided. It's interesting that they were divided. So even though their pride was there, some within their ranks were like, hey, I, we, we got to pause here. We got to wait here because look at these signs. And I think Nicodemus was on that side. Um, now, keep in, mind, this man, keep in mind that the blind man hasn't seen Jesus with his eyes yet, but they ask him in verse 17, what do you say about him? 
It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, he's a prophet. What else is he going to say? What do prophets do? In the Old Testament, prophets did miracles. And this was a whopper of a miracle. Um, and it's an obvious conclusion that the Pharisees should have come to as well, that Jesus is a prophet. Now, they have no comeback for this. Um, so they try a different tactic. They, they go, well, this must be a fake healing. So let's, let's, call in, let's call in your mom and dad here and let's ask them. So in, in verse 19, they say, is this your son? Uh, is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he can see? And these poor parents, um, they've been through a lot. Um, they probably had people always thinking that it was something they did. Because can, a, can an infant inside a womb sin to be born blind? So it's, they were probably pointing at the parents. Um, and now they're being questioned that they made the whole thing up. I mean, come on, they had suffered for years, maybe 30 years of having a son blind. And so they go, yes, he's our son. Yes, he was born blind. But how he can see and who opened his eyes? Ask him because he's of age. And we know from what John says that they, they did it this way because they didn't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. They were nowhere near as bold as their son is at this point. Um, he's not afraid of the Pharisees. He was blind, but now he can see. And the joy <coughs> filling his heart is beyond um, what we can probably imagine. Now, we don't know how long between investigations. Looks like I got some trouble here. We don't know how long uh, between investigations, um, but they call him in a second time. And they said, now, th now keep in mind, he hasn't, still hasn't seen who Jesus is, or he hasn't seen him. And they say, give glory to God, for we know that this man is a sinner. Which means basically, give glory to God by agreeing with us that this man is a sinner. And I love the logical and practical <laughs> and wisdom and boldness of this uneducated, uneducated man. So whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do, I was blind and now I can see. Such a great verse. All I know is I was blind and now I can see. It applies to all of us. Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to open our eyes. And here's the thing. Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. The blindness goes away. But we have to turn to the Lord. When we humble ourselves before Jesus and we repent and trust in Him as Lord and Savior, He takes away our spiritual blindness. Now, I don't know about you, but I put humbleness and repentance on the same level. I don't think you can have one without the other. In order to repent means that you have to admit that you're wrong, and that takes humbleness. Um, Jesus allows us to see things in a completely different way, uh, the way he wants us to see. And I know it's still painful, but we can have joy, like James 1 says, when trials come our way. Be joyful when trials come our way. And Hebrews 12 says that when trials come, it's discipline from God because he loves us. So why does he do that? Because he loves us. We did it with our kids. I'm sure you did it with yours. If you have them, you discipline so that they grew up and respected you and respected God. God does the same thing. Um, now he calls us to have compassion on our enemies, praying that they too will turn to Jesus and have their blindness taken away. He's the light of the world. And we, we now are supposed to reflect that light. The question is, how are we doing in that area? How are we reflecting his light at work or um, wherever we're, we're going about? And now the blind man, he starts to toy with the Pharisees. <laughs> Why do you want to hear my healing story again? Do you want to become his disciples too? And, and you know, he's just agitating him now. Because um, I think he's getting frustrated with the fact that, that they don't, get it. Um, and they say, we are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The blind man nailed it to me in verse 30. Now that's remarkable, he said. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. 
We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody's ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. You notice the boldness increasing? He's, he's bringing it to the Pharisees saying, you can go to no other conclusion that Jesus is God because he healed my eyes. Now, here's the thing. Um, you ever notice when, when somebody doesn't have a good answer, um, they just attack? Um, they realized that they didn't have a good answer to this because the man was being logical and he was being true. Um, so they realized that their, their argument's not going any, any further than, they, they, they're not going to convince this guy. Um, and they can't deny the huge, huge miracle that has just happened. So uh, you were steeped in birth, they said. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him up. But Jesus is so gracious, isn't he? So this man gets tossed from the synagogue. He's gone um, and can no longer come back there. Um, and so Jesus knew that the Pharisees threw him out. And so then Jesus personally meets this man to strengthen his faith. He finds the man and asks this question. Do you believe in the Son of Man? The Son of Man is actually a reference from Daniel uh, that refers to the Christ. And this man gets his first sight of the one who healed him. He healed his physical blindness and is about to heal his spiritual blindness. He says, who is he, sir? Tell me that I may believe in him. Jesus says, you have now seen him, and in fact, he's the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. No questions, no doubts, just I believe. Just like the thief on the cross, this man could do nothing to earn God's favor. Um, he came to him as a blind beggar, just believe. Romans 10, 9 uh, to 11, you probably all know this one, says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will, not might, you will be saved. This poor beggar was saved for all eternity. And the Pharisees who rejected Jesus were not. You cannot go to be where I am. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? This man probably thought he was cursed by God, being born blind, but finds out that he was actually loved by God the whole time. Whatever difficulty you have going on in your life right now, will you trust that you are loved? Will you trust that God is using that for both your spiritual sight and for his glory? Being loved by a powerful and holy God is an awesome thing. Um, and he brings forgiveness. You are loved so much that he gave his son to take the wrath for our sin. God did that for us. So that you, along with this man, born blind, can be in heaven for all eternity. And then the next thing, and he worshiped him. No questions, just worship. Worship Jesus for who he is. Worship Jesus because he's God. Worshiping Jesus because he's king. How do you worship the one who took away your spiritual blindness? Do you worship him every day? <clears throat> worship him this Christmas season. It's right around the corner. Do you worship him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Humbling ourselves in repentance and faith results in true worship. Giving glory to God by acknowledging who he is Jesus said in verse 39, he said, for judgment I've come into the world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. So the principle of this section is rejecting Jesus is spiritual blindness. Have you ever struggled with Jesus' claims of who he is? Are there areas of your life where you are still have some spiritual blindness? Will you lay these doubts at the foot of the cross and ask Jesus to strengthen your faith? Jesus is the light of the world. And, and praise God that we have seen that light and are no longer blind. 
And will you worship God by being bold for Christ in a dark world? I just looked, I think uh, we've hit now 8.1 billion people in this world. Um, and we know that many, the majority of those are spiritually blind. Um, let's continue to pray for those, especially this season as we um, celebrate Christmas and we gather around friends and family. And some of those maybe are not believers. Let's pray. Pray that God would take away their spiritual blindness. Pray that you would get an opening to share um, just how Jesus has impacted your life. So now um, we have a break. We have no class for the next three weeks. Merry Christmas. Um, we all made it. First half of the study is done. Um, now, don't forget to come back on January 8th when we get to look at chapter 10, which is the Good Shepherd. And I would just ask if you would think about inviting. We have some room in our class. Invite some guys for the second half of John. Um, it's going to be it's going to be good. Um, and then I would ask that you would. Uh, Go out and have some, all the food from all the groups are out there and just uh, hang out. We invited the, the women to come with us uh, and join us in celebrating Christmas. So I'd, I'd, I'd ask you to stick around for a few minutes if you can. Um, but let's pray and then we'll let you go. Lord God, um, what a great lesson. Thank you for opening this man's eyes. Thank you for opening our eyes. Thank you for uh, even the trials that come our way so that we can remain humble um, and, and remain faithful to you as the Lord and Savior. Lord, help us to celebrate your birth uh, this Christmas season and help us bring us back safely on January 8th so we can continue to study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great Christmas. See you next year.